Welcome, everybody, to Press B to Cancel, the greatest podcast you'll listen to until that other one. This week, I'm your rotating host, Sick Jake. I'm not alone. No, sir. In this reality, I have two friends backing me up. Wolf, how are you doing this week? I am doing quite well, thank you. Awesome. And before you can say anything, Palsh, thank you very much for not doing the mouth sounds. You've made my fry day. fry day. You know, you're welcome. But we haven't done the intro yet, so it's okay. No, no, no. Cold open. Cold open. No, we, don't, we, don't, we don't need no intro. Mm-hmm. No, mm-hmm. no, no. And there it is. Oh. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> and this is where we put the actual music. <laughs> People, <laughs> people think virtual reality will make you queasy, but really, it's Paul. Paul should know sounds. I, I really, I think we should do a Twitter thing where it says, "What, what is Paul attempting to do?" So that will bring in, because we had that original song before we got the actual <laughs> one. We should see. We could. We should see if anybody catches on <laughs> what it was. Put it together, man. We'll tweet it. I had to catch up on the social media stuff this weekend. I'm posting on Instagram. It's good. Yes, that too, actually. Instagram is okay. Anyways, so what are we talking about today? All right, so this is kind of a topic that's been dear to me over the last couple of years. Warframe. And that's virtual reality. No, not war- Warframe. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even imagine Warframe in virtual reality. How fast you could puke. Oh, <laughs> like, <dude. laughs> yeah. and I'm not talking about that last story mission, which is bad. No, just VR is a very special thing to me. Um, you know, the recent news with the Oculus Rift, well, not recent news, and the Kickstarters, the Origins, all of that. I love all that stuff. I eat it up. But it comes from ideas that have been around for decades. Virtual reality has been a dream of nerds and geeks <laughs> since the 60s, right? Even before that. So we're going to talk a bit about, we're going to focus on early VR, 90s VR. Um, What's so VR? that's what we're going to discuss. What's VR? VR? What's a VR? Uh, a victory for? receiver. A victory receiver. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's that's what that means. That's right? what those headsets are called, victory receivers. Okay. <laughs> I feel like before we really dig into it, we should talk about like the first, I don't know, mention of the idea of VR. I guess. Oh, Virtual Boy. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this goes all the way back to 1932, man. Yeah, yeah the Viewmaster. Yeah. Well, no, like virtual virtual reality as we know it, there was a book called Pygmalion's Spectacles. Get that for the Kindle. Yeah. So yeah. the idea, I can actually, I I looked it up on the li- in my library app to see if I could check it out. I can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm All curious right. now, but uh, basically, it was research. an idea where you'd put on these the in the book the character could put on glasses, and it would totally immerse them in a virtual world pretty wild like they were imagining this sort of thing how would it immerse them visuals smells feeling all of it and this is the 30s yeah like yeah. the fact that somebody dreamed this up in 1932 is kind of wild to me yeah well and i love it because like for that time period as well what was probably a toy for a lot of us in the 80s the Viewmaster was first created in 1936 right I wait wait Viewmaster, are you talking about like the the thing that it had those like round discs of film? Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, okay. Gotcha. So it has a lot of hallmarks of virtual reality, right? It's a headset and you put to your eyes, two screens, stereoscopic 3D, right? And it's it's images. <laughs> so like it's all the rage in the 30s. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna be a little bit. I today I learned that that thing is stereoscopic. Well, the other two images. Yeah, because I have a lazy <laughs> eye. That was, oh. <laughs> so it was never explained to me as a child that they were, that it was supposed to be a stereoscopic image and that there were two images in it. And so I always, I'd look in and I'd see the picture with my right eye and I'd be like, okay, it's a picture, you know? <laughs> like, mom, this is great and all, but can I just look at pictures in the fridge instead? It's... <laughs> Let's like, put the box. These days, I don't even know if it would work for me. My my left eye works better than it did when, when I was young, but I still... 
when faced with <laughs> making a choice between two different images, my brain is like, all right, right eye, man. Yeah, fuck, <laughs> fuck you. We're so going to go with this the, one. 3D glasses, virtual reality with stereoscopic imaging doesn't work that well for me. Like, it was never great for me either. Like, I, those 3D eye puzzles, they were all the rage in the uh, I've was never, late 90s. I've yeah, never managed one. Yeah. Once. I got one once. Are those VR? No. So I guess we're being a bit cheeky with the idea of VR, right? But the idea of like, like Wolf mentioned, fiction talking about the worlds of strapping glasses on and seeing a whole other world, you know, taste and smells and all that stuff early on, right? It's been a dream of many, but the Viewmasters is like one kind of step toward it, right? The idea of putting something to your eyes, seeing 3D, another world. Uh, I was going to mention this specifically because I think it's funny or interesting, the military in the 40s purchased 100,000 Viewmasters to use in, like, military training. What? Why? It's the weirdest <laughs> thing. I was looking... There's pictures on of it online. Yeah. It's discs of um, <laughs> images of uh, ships and planes. So soldiers would train to identify ships and planes and targets from far away using a Viewmaster. <laughs> they just wow. have, like, pictures of Hitler superimposed on everything. <laughs> <laughs> Just Gosh. flicking through, yeah. Smurf, 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 Smurf Hitler, Hitler, Smurf, <laughs> and then Smurf, Smurf, Pinup Girl, Hitler. <laughs> no, it's it's wild, <laughs> but that's the idea with virtual reality. Early virtual reality was like the domain of military and universities, right? So I think a little bit later on, we had 1962, something created called the Sensorama. Yes, I saw was, that too. Did you? You want to explain a little bit? Uh, that was kind of cool. It it uh, basically it was this little you'd you'd put your face up against it, much like you would with the Virtual Boy. The the you know the view the glasses didn't move, but you'd see a film, and then it would give you the sound that would go along with the film and the sound the the smells that would go along with the film. And oh, right, right, I think right, there was yeah. even some sort of haptic feedback that would like rumble your chair a little bit or something. Yeah, and... your chair moves and there's fans to blow breeze on you. Yeah, that's, <laughs> like, like that's it's actually pretty cool. Yeah, that's that's something I wanted to talk about. Actually, that the haptic feedback is really fucking cool. It's the sort of technology you saw mass produced for major stage shows in the 90s at like Disney World and stuff. Oh, the 4D rides. Like, yeah, the 4D rides, like, uh, what, Honey, I Shrunk the Audience. Yeah. Where, oh, you know, right, there was, yeah. you were supposed to have the 3D glasses and, you know, it would pump scents in and make it feel like mice were running between your legs with poofs of air and things like that. So it was, it was very much that sort of thing. In that sense, I guess it's really stretching the definition of virtual reality, but it's it's still kind of that same sort of realm, I guess. They're related a lot more than I realized until I started doing research for this episode, to be honest. It's that immersive experience, right? That yeah. That people have wanted throughout the decades. Like we mentioned, so the Sensorama had the, the fans that made a breeze. So there was like a, uh, I think one video was you walking through the street and the breeze from the streets and the sounds and smells. The uh, Oculus Rift, when it first came out, one of the dev kits, one of the big things people are excited about was somebody, somebody may have like a, a bird a simulator where you had to flap your arms to fly and then you would strap a fan or turn a fan on next to you so you could feel the breeze on your neck as you're flying. And this was like mind blowing to people in 2000s <laughs> or 2015 <laughs> or 2014, whatever it is. But it's something that they were doing in the 60s <laughs> and then later at Disney World and just wild. So the idea of immersive experience is, is key. Yeah. Um, but when we're talking virtual reality, we're thinking more maybe the more interactive experiences, right? Not necessarily watching a movie, although that's very cool. Um, so we're looking at uh, 1966, and we'll get to the 90s. We're almost there. 1966 was probably the, considered the first HMD, or the head-mounted display. The whole idea of strapping a screen to those eyeballs. Not the HUD, which is pretty much we see in every first-person shooter. <laughs> Heads-up display. <laughs> see? I research. I'm, no, I'm good at this. A+. plus. Thank you. So this one was Ivan Sutherland. I think it was MIT. And again, universities were so key for all the early technology research. Oh, yeah. But uh, his display 
can't remember if I got the res for this one. I did get the resolutions for it, but basic wireframe rooms. Yeah, 2284 or something like that. <laughs> it probably, honestly. I know the when we get to the 90s, it was still very low res. That was a problem of virtual reality. But the neat thing with this one in 66, the idea of a head-mounted display that had head tracking, right? The ability to look around your surroundings, which is something that is okay now with virtual reality, but it took a number of years to get to a place where it was comfortable to move your head and, and have the tracking accurate. So the way they did it in 66 was funny. It uses some kind of metal linkages attached to a large metal arm mounted to the ceiling because this thing was heavy as all <laughs> hell. So it had to be supported from the ceiling. It was so big, it was called the Sword of Damocles, <laughs> which is just wild to me. And all it was was the ability to walk around a 3D room or look around a 3D room in 66, which I think is funny. On, on top of that, I'm pretty sure it wasn't exactly virtual reality, but augmented reality. Right. Right. Which I also wouldn't have expected to be that old. If you're talking augmented, rea augmented reality or uh, something victory, I guess, AR, something victory. What's the A stand for this time? <laughs> Arnold. We'll figure something out. <laughs> Arnold, Arnold Victory. If we're talking, all, like, if it's going to be augmented reality, would that be like a heads up display in that? <laughs> so you're basically yes. looking. So, so we're we're going back to the heads up display, the HUD. Look at me, God damn, I'm good at this. It's totally uh, accurate. It's relevant, right? That's what Google Glass was, right? It's an idea to have consumer augmented reality, a screen augmenting your vision, even if it was tiny. Uh, and there's there's devices now that I think Microsoft has the one I can't recall the name of it that they tried pushing for a while and it was laying over graphics over your a camera view in front of you. Oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. I can't remember what it's called either. But yeah, <laughs> there's a vaccine joke I want to make there, but I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got to keep these episodes timeless in that yeah. post-COVID world. Yeah, but. But it's 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 all really great stuff, right? Because VR is not just a screen strapped to your face, but it's also the accessories, right? So take us to the 80s, and this is going to bring us into retro gaming, I promise. There's a company called VPL Research, and they're probably the ones that pioneered the idea of the glove, the data glove, that allows gestures and movements to be your input in a v virtual world. Oh, like the power Almost glove like GP has for NES? Yes, and actually, so Mattel licensed the technology from VPL for the for the power glove, from what I understand. I was trying to be cheeky. Shit. You're being accurate. Look at this research this man has done. <laughs> Damn. So, GP's not here, unfortunately, but did either of you guys have the power glove? No, I never even got to try it. I I played a few games with it. The last one, I think, was Tiger Heli, and it was just not a good mix. <laughs> <laughs> that's what i was waiting for yeah everybody i've talked to who's played it and you're like oh what was it oh yeah you know <laughs> yeah. It was not... so the reason i thought it was was not so great like the idea of strapping a glove to your wrist to play games on paper sounds really cool to a seven-year-old but uh most of the games it really was just gestures moving your hand left and right and it would make the character on screen move you, you jerk your hand and make mario jump that kind of thing it, not very intuitive there's only one game that really, I think, did it well. It was like Powerball or, or Handball. And it was like a a brick-breaking game. And we had to grab a ball and throw it. And you actually had to make the hand movements. Whereas games like Punch-Out, you had to like duck your hand or something to make your character duck. It felt really stupid. We saw GP playing that on stream. And <laughs> he was trying to explain how you actually do that in that game. And, I mean, every commercial you saw made it made it out to be the coolest thing you'll ever see, right? Because, you know, you're playing punch out, you're yeah. throwing fists and, like, just at the air, and, you know, you're going to be the champion. But, no, he was just, like, basically, like, saying his – hold his arm up, his his shoulder would be killing him after the end of the match <laughs> because he's basically holding his, his shoulder – his hand up shoulder height and then, like, moving his thumb, twisting his wrist. <laughs> and, like, every now and then it would be, like, pulling – pulling towards his body or something. So it was oh, yeah. really nothing like you'd expect. It was like the way it works. Like he explained it. I, I just, I still don't get it. Before you can even use it. If I remember right, you had to open a book of codes and punch in the code into the glove to get the right control scheme for that game. It was really stupid, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, amazing again to a seven year old. And for 
people who are seven who played with a power glove, you just know in you know 2020 or 2015, they're all thinking about how to incorporate the power gloves original dream <laughs> yeah. into the modern stuff, right? Haptic feedback, like we talked about the moving chair in the 60s. Haptic feedback is something that's only kind of recently come back into video games, right? That's a whole technology in itself is the cool thing. There was actually a tech in the 90s that made use of haptic feedback with a glove. Oh, really? Yes. I don't remember. I, I didn't take notes, so I suck. But I don't. So I don't remember the company that did it. But it had twelve haptic. It had twelve cent. Uh, twelve points on the hand. Two on each finger. Two on the palm. With little air sacs that would inflate when you pushed against something in the virtual reality world you were playing in. Oh, see, that's and it awesome. Would, and it would provide a little pressure against your your hand to make it feel like you were interacting with something. So it literally would inflate and deflate in different ways so you would feel like you're actually gripping something in the game which i thought is mind-blowing yeah that, that's cool so if anybody is interested haptic technology is like it's a whole different technology in itself which is kind of cool when you combine it with virtual reality yeah we tend to just think of it as like rumble on a controller yeah right and that, and that's another example right and that's a very base version of it but go ahead. Oh yeah, but it's it's nothing really specific uh, at its base level. Haptic means anything relating to the sense of touch. So like Jake said, with the the fans and making it feel like there was mice running next to you, and you know the air on the back of your neck when you're flying like a bird. All those that's those are examples of haptic feedback. You know your body is feeling this even though you're trying to experience something else through the headset. So if you, if you're just curious, haptic is literally the Greek word for touch. So it's, it's Oh, look at you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this I learned. The Wikipedia, all right. Yeah. Well, I love it though cuz the PS5 uh suppose I've not played the PS5. Probably will not buy one, but I'm tempted to get a controller <laughs> just to see if the the haptic triggers and what they feel like, but I think it's very limited support for games. Yeah. It could be like the 3D TV of five years ago, <laughs> but it's at least it's it's a technology that decades after it first appeared, they're still trying to figure a way to bring it to people because people do want it. That immersive side of things, right? Yeah, I mean the evolution. It, people say what happened in the 90s and what happened to like bring it back, but it, it, it like since you know Oculus and stuff in the last 10 years. It hasn't gone anywhere. It just hasn't been in the limelight. It's been constantly being worked on and worked on and worked on. You know, maybe video games aren't getting it, but everything else is. There's still, like, medical training, uh, military training, you know, flights, pilot training, you know, astronauts. All these things come into play with uh, virtual reality, and that's where they really shine. It's not even really being... I think the fact that it's being, uh, you know, applied to video games is more of a modern thing now because it's like, okay, we're getting somewhere now. We can kind of make this into a video game. But before that, it seems like training purposes and military and and university use has been the biggest thing. So it's kind of cool when you see these crazy things go into video game territory. Right, because the cost has got to be a big factor to this, where universities and governments and militaries can afford this kind of tech. Exactly. But to get it cheap is always a problem. The reason the Oculus is even a thing is because of cell phones, right? Cell phones technology and the constant churning these out of better and newer and better screens brought the cost of LCD screens down to a point where it was actually, you know, worth the funds to put two of them and strap them to a person's face. That's all VR is in modern times. It's cell phone screen technology. It's crazy. Yeah. So anyway, go. we should go back to 90s. So going back from what I can see from... So after Power Glove, um, there are a few other companies that worked on the idea of, uh, of HMD, to strap people's faces for the purpose of virtual reality and, and all that. But it was 91, I think it was, where Sega tried doing, uh, at least for the arcade space in the UK, uh, it was Sega VR. And I didn't realize this, but originally Sega VR was something they were 
designing to bring to the home for the Sega Genesis. Yeah, I think that was, was that due to come out in 91 or 93? I think it was like 93, I, I believe. I want to say it was 93. It was supposed to come out for the holiday season in 93. And it did not pan out, even though they were like hyping it all the way until August, I think. Well, it was wild because like the game that was going to launch with it was Virtua Racing, which was an awesome game. I love Virtua Racing. I played it in arcades. I did play the Genesis version, which had a special cart. I had no idea that that was literally going to be a virtual reality title. <laughs> I mean, it's in the name. <laughs> I, 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 that's one of the subjects I kind of dug into was Sega VR. Sure, I only touched the, what I just mentioned. So if you have more, that's great. It's it's pretty interesting. So essentially, what happened is Sega was wanting to get into the VR space because early '90s VR was just the hype. You know, if you had a way to bring VR home or more interesting experiences than a controller in your hand. This is where the activator comes into play with Sega and things like that. (laughs) Motion controls. Oh yeah. Yes. So Sega was like, well, we want to do Sega VR and they actually had a working machine at an affordable price. So the, the big issue then was head tracking. Head tracking was ridiculously expensive we're talking like $50,000 a unit. Look, if you have to use the sword of Damocles, it's going to it's going to be expensive, <laughs> all right? That's just you you don't cheap out on a sword of Damocles. It's not something you get at Kmart. Well, Sega reached out to a company that was developing a different way to do it, and they worked with them and ended up coming up with a way to track your head for a dollar a unit. Do you know what they were using? It was an LED with a few mirrors that would basically give the tracker an idea of where the head was based on the angle of the LED light and the brightness that it was perceiving. Got it. Yeah, definitely a whole lot cheaper than magnetic systems and stuff. That's yeah. Really trying. So it's like this made it to where it was going to be $200 a unit, which is great. What ended up happening was they were, you know, they were getting companies signed up to purchase a whole bunch of units. All sorts of retailers were excited to buy, you know, thousands of units each. And come, I think, September, Sega quietly killed it off. And the reason for that was people were getting sick in the test groups. (laughs) Motion sickness. Because the the problem was, you know, even though it worked, it was an eight megahertz processor producing the animation. And so it was really, really low frame rate. I was going to say it must have been like 10, 15, 20 frames per second or something. <laughs> yeah, it was really bad. And so people were getting sick from that and just not feeling well. Which is... The, one of the biggest things, too. So Yeah, and to, to jump ahead a little bit to the Virtual Boy, that was one of the big downsides to the Virtual Boy for me when I'd try it, is I'd stick my head in there and play a game for 10 minutes, and I'd come out and I'd feel like it was two hours later. <laughs> and I, I know it's not that long, but my eyes and my brain are like, whoa, what has just happened? Oh, are, are we comparing Virtual Boy stories now? Because cause I got one. No, I'm saying like if if the Virtual Boy was that bad, and the Virtual Boy's frame rate, I don't remember being bad. Granted, it was only producing red. It was basically a beefed up Game Boy producing one color. So <laughs> it didn't have a whole lot of colors to produce, a whole lot of shades to produce. It was fine. This was producing Genesis images. It was full color, full resolution, all that but it was just making people really sick. And so Sega, <laughs> Sega's public announcement, it, it's hilarious to me, is it felt so real that they had to cancel it because people were getting sick. <laughs> <laughs> just like real life in a cockpit of a car. And you got to throw so up a little. It was a half-truth. It, people were getting sick, but not because it felt so real, but because the experience was so jarring. <laughs> yeah. I mean if for argument's sake, like I forget what we see, what uh like 
the equivalent frame rate we see in real life is like what, like ninety or something the frames a second, something stupid like that <laughs> compared to twenty. It's like, yeah, it's it's like one, it's like a quarter, right? <laughs> Not even. Well, that was one of the things with the Rift, where the early Rift I think was sixty frames if you're lucky with a good computer, and I used to feel motion sick with it, but the um, the second gen dev kit, which is what I got. I believe it goes up to 90. It's at least 75. And that extra 25 hertz or whatever actually makes a difference. There's a real connection between the eyes and the brain and motion sickness, depending on frame rate. It's really interesting. I can't only imagine like 10 <laughs> playing virtual racing. Yeah, it's it's it sucks though, because, you know, Sega was all in on this thing. They had done their big announcement spiel with like, major advertising, hiring an MTV personality to do the show, all this stuff. And then as the the release window was coming up, they even had a deal with Alphabet Serial, which I had completely forgotten existed <laughs> until I was oh my doing God. my research today. It's the breakfast version of SpaghettiOs. <laughs> yeah, basically. So they, they had a deal where, you know, you'd get instant wins in your box, you'd find a code for like, yeah, you instantly won this, you instantly won that, and you'd contact Alphabets and say, hey, I won this, and they're like, all right, give us the code and all that. Yeah, we call that Publisher's Clearinghouse, so you don't trust that stuff? <laughs> <laughs> the Se Sega VR was one of those prizes, which they could never actually give out. So they were oh, wow. all in on this thing, and they had to back out. It must have been just painful for Sega in a number of ways. Can you imagine, you're a kid, you're eating a stale-ass alphabets because your mom won't get you the Frosted <laughs> Flakes. You pulled that instant win ticket. You really wanted, like, the toy whistle or something. But no, you got these instant win codes, and you actually win Sega VR. And you wait, like, six months, and then Ted Kaczynski sends you that personal mail and says, Kid, I'm sorry. It's not going to happen. It's too real. <laughs> Here's this copy of Vector Man instead. <laughs> Oh, I'm like, sure they probably gave those kids a Sega CD or something instead, but still. Oh, you know. boy. <laughs> yeah, and <Ed> Sewer Shark. <laughs> <laughs> Here's this copy of Night Trap, kid. You're welcome. And the best part is that you'd probably throw up just from, like, spite at that point, not from motion sickness. <laughs> I'm curious what they actually gave the kids as a prize package. Yeah, I didn't think to look into that, if it was even something people have on do have documented or not that's wild all right sega vr so that was canceled i guess but one thing that was around for a couple of years at least not in the home market but basically in arcade situations was a company called w industries who created something called uh virtual what was it called virtuality, virtuality. yeah so they were in like 90 91 and this is the one i recognize so when i think of like 90s vr this is the one I got a chance to play a couple times. I'm trying to remember as a kid where I played it. I thought it was at the um, Toronto c &E. Canada's Wonderland, man. Canada's Wonderland. Yeah, exactly. And that's where it ended up being. It's Canada's Wonderland. They had the kiosk set up. And they're basically these podium type of deals with a sensor ring around the perimeter of the person. You strap this huge-ass plastic thing to your face with a big colorful band. You played on an SU-1000. The naming conventions for those things are ridiculous to me. <laughs> I think naming conventions of hardware for video games has never been good, right? <laughs> the new, new Nintendo DS. It's over the top, but also like hit the nail on the head kind of accuracy. So yeah. before we dig into what the hardware is, they had there was the early version, which I think was the CS1000, and that one was open. Yes. And that one people could just walk away from until the machine yanked them backwards. Yeah. So they ended up starting to make the ones where you're harnessed in. And those there were two versions of those. There was the SU-1000 and the SD-1000. Those stand for stand up and sit down. <laughs> What's wrong with that? That's I just accurate. think it's hilarious. Yeah, it's the most literal thing when they're trying to make this crazy space age technology. And it's just like, <laughs> stand up, sit down. Use carsman, carsman salesman type of tactic. It's like what you got here, boys. It's the latest in the SD technology. Slap. Have a little sit down in this car here. I got to say, I was surprised to learn that uh, 
it was initially built on an Amiga 3000. Yes, but have you seen the graphics? It's no longer a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so before we get to the games, so th- the thing with this thing is um, pods ring around you, huge ass helmet, the screen resolution, here's where I have the numbers, two LCD screens, 275 by 375 pixels in each eye. That's low. <laughs> <laughs> And they were That's actually, they were rendered mirrored because they would shoot in sideways and then mirror the image to your eyes. Right. And what's wild for me is my memories as a kid playing with this thing. Before you get to Dactyl Nightmare, I only played this game, but I didn't know there's pterodactyls or pterodactyls in it because at the time I needed glasses. So <laughs> strapped to this poor kid, this virtual reality helmet and tell him it's a game. I can barely see as it is, but also there's like a magnifying lens effect Mm. And you can barely see a damn thing <laughs> through that thing. I barely made out that I had a, a plagal gun in my hand and I could shoot it with this big clunky controller and joystick thing to shove in your hand. And uh, it wasn't until later on, uh, actually recently, when I realized that was Dactyl Nightmare and there was a dinosaur flying above your head that occasionally would swoop down and you could shoot it. Or you could shoot another player because this neat thing with this is it did have multiplayer as an option. I I find it crazy because if you look in like the eighties uh, prototype stuff that they were doing, the original helmets they were less headsets and more helmets, and they looked like yes. uh, the best way I can explain it is thinking of those helmets that you'll see a baseball player wear with like the one ear open. It looked like that with a molded piece of like a visor <laughs> stuck on the end of it, and then. By the time the 90s came around and the virtuality stuff started taking over more, those things were so honking huge with the giant visors. You end, If you get one of the red ones, you look like B- Black Manta from the DC comics. <laughs> so I, I just, I always thought that was hilarious. You go from a baseball player to a, a second rate supervillain. Well, it's it's wild though, because I mean, this is, this is be LCD screens were, you know, still a novelty back then, right? Flat screens weren't in every home, I don't think. When did flat screens come out? I guess that was 90s. Mid-90s. Yeah. Yeah. So it's still pretty new. I didn't have a flat screen until... Okay, I didn't have a flat screen tube TV (laughs) until around 2004. Right. So... (laughs) So the idea that they're doing these LCD screens on people's heads is wild. And even then, they understood the importance of immersion. These things had four speakers built into it which I think is wild. Um, so that, that's pretty neat. But yeah, it's that's the only experience I really had with VR. You paid five bucks for a couple of minutes with this thing strapped to your, your head. I couldn't make out a damn thing. Yep. But it was neat. The idea of virtual reality was cool. Um, I love that uh, when the Oculus dev kit came out around that time, somebody using clips of Dactyl Nightmare he found on YouTube, which is very little footage of this game, by the way, um, he made a recreation of it for the Oculus. And it's called Paragon or Polygon Nightmare or something. And it's but it's not necessarily exactly the same because he's trying to pitch it together from screenshots essentially. Yeah, screenshots and news footage. Yeah, yeah, like game preservation is really important, right? And I think this is a situation where it's kind of failed. You have a whole range of games for this thing. There's at least a handful of games for a virtuality that you can't play anymore. They don't exist anymore, right? Maybe somebody maybe has it hopefully in storage somewhere to hang on to, but nobody's dumped these ROMs for MAME, right? For Dactyl Nightmare. I wish that was a thing. Yeah, there are just, there are games that have completely disappeared or, you know, people have the physical copies, but they don't work anymore because of the bit rot. So there, there are literally just games that probably faded into nothing at this point. Uh, I was watching, one of the videos I was watching was a YouTuber who goes by Octavius King. And she was like, I did a bunch of scouring of the internet and I found that there are no less than 20, but no more than 40 games made for the virtuality (laughs) systems. Yeah. But I can't find a hard number or any solid evidence as to how many and what all all of them were. It is very hard to find this, right? Canada's Wonderland, which is like a treat for a kid, right? These weren't in your home. You're lucky you've got to play it. And even if you did, you could barely see anything. Or for the two minutes you had access to it, 
how much do you remember of these experiences? Right. I remember trying to get somewhere and I couldn't shoot, so I stopped moving. And apparently in the game that I was playing, if you stop moving, you really can't hit anything. So I was like, fuck. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I know. It's, I'm, still, it's I'm still a little disappointed. I'm, I'm not going to lie. There is one. I, I want to say it was 90s as well. I didn't get a chance to look this up too much. But I remember watching videos of this. Mech Warrior Battle Pods as a sort of immersive VR experience, right? Where you're actually in a sit-down experience with a huge screen, and it's, it's Mech Warrior. I always wanted to play that. I I would love the hell out of that. I don't know if you guys had a chance to play that. I believe it's pronounced Mech Warrior. <laughs> of course. The Canadian pronunciation. <laughs> no, I have no, no idea. No, it's one of those things. So I, I, I want to say that the game that I got to try when I played one of these was Grid Busters. But I can't be certain. Okay. There were two games that looked vaguely like the game I could have played and also vaguely not like the game I could have played. <laughs> I don't know. This was from like a trip on... Uh, my my dad was a comedian. He was working on a cruise ship at the time, so he was able to bring someone with him every time he went. So one year, uh, as a birthday present, I got to go on with him for like a five-day cruise, right? Because he was an entertainer on there. I got to try this on a cruise ship. So we're out on the ocean. I got to play virtual reality while bobbing up and down on the seas. <laughs> That's immersion right there. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I honestly can't say for certain what game it was I played. But it was, a, it was a really weird experience. Fortunately, I did it on like the third day. So I was already kind of used to the bobbing up and down. I love it because cruise ship is exactly where you'd want it. You'd end up seeing a virtual reality type thing. Oh, right? yeah. Is that novelty factor? For sure. It was what? Probably Carnival. I'm pretty sure it was Carnival Cruise Lines. Yeah. It was one of their family ones. So it had a big ass arcade on the ship. And they had this and then they had like the four player virtual racing and four player Daytona USA. Things like that. Right. Right. So, yeah, that's when I got to try it. It was a short lived and particularly for me, disappointing experience. So I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't really store much of that information. So what I'm, what I'm seeing, I'm like, I don't know if it's this game or that game, or if it was either one of those. And it just comes back to like, I, I wish there's more video footage of these games. I'd love to see what the differences are. Right. Cause I mean, you had first person shooters around that time, but I mean, I think I want to say they're like Doom and and uh, Hexen, so they're still at two D based, right? Dactyl Nightmare was three D polygons, which is pretty cool for its time. Yeah, I call I called uh, Dactyl Nightmare and all the early uh, VR stuff like that. I used to consider that twenty four bit because I was like, it's not sixteen bit; it's better than sixteen bit because it's you know stuff that Super Nintendo couldn't do. You know, Star Fox was still you know, and Stunt Race VX, all those ones were a little bit more simplified, but because it was just triangles and stuff but it was just like it, it felt like a really 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 prototype playstation one game before they had textures and it just <laughs> <laughs> so i always could yeah. so i always called that like 24 bit because it was like it's like that lost generation that doesn't exist you know which which totally existed you you often see like people classify neo geo as 24 bit but honestly it's an overclocked genesis well that's <laughs> That's some serious it's, blast processing. It's, it's like the same processors as the Sega Genesis for like two of the main processors. They're just overclocked. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's video games for sure back then, right? Like the same Motorola processors used in multiple consoles, right? It was, it was accessible, it was cheap to produce. So everybody snapped it up for their machines. Yeah. Turbo, like, and uh, this is total tangent, but you, you know, you remember, I don't know if you guys remember the Atari Jaguar commercials. 32 plus 32 equals 64. Do the math. Yeah. And, you know, they were trying to claim it was a 64-bit system when it was a 32-bit system. And honestly, it looked worse than PlayStation. I don't know where they got off trying to Wait, say it was 64-bit. It wasn't 64-bit? No, it was two 32-bit processors. Holy shit, I've been lied to. <laughs> by, that, by that math, the Saturn should have been a 96-bit system. And it was not. <laughs> As as dirty as Sega as as dirty as Sega did the consumer market in the mid nineties, they didn't do that. 
And, <laughs> this and is, I appreciate that. You know that. what? That's that's fair. <laughs> but even it going back to the Turbo Graphics 16, it was a 16-bit processor on the graphics, but it was an 8-bit processor for everything else. And that's what counts right. when you're talking about that. So the Turbo Graphics was an 8-bit machine. All bits. See? Mm-hmm. All these bits. Do we want to talk about Virtual Boy? The only experience okay. I know two things about Virtual Boy, okay? So one is my personal experience, which I will tell you if asked. But my second is apparently Virtual Boy is not technically actually virtual reality. No. Because it's just two images that are slightly different angles just to give that feel of virtual reality, but it's still just two flat images, basically. So the Virtual Boy actually had oscillating screens, right? The uh, the Virtual Boy <laughs> screens vibrate back and forth to give you the an effect. That's why it hums, or at least that's what Wiki tells me anyway. So there's more going on there than even like the Oculus. The Oculus is just a cell phone screen and, and magnifying lens in front of it, right? I guess. <laughs> uh, I I think it's virtual reality, but like I think the problem the virtual the virtual the Virtual Boy is missing things like the head tracking, right? This is a thing where you had to bafflingly, Nintendo says you, you put it on a stand and you hunch in the most uncomfortable position possible <laughs> over a table. Yeah, right. To look into this thing. <laughs> like, it was like a it was like a souped up Game Boy is is what it was. Because, I mean, you had a controller that controlled everything. The games weren't like a, a 3D thing where you weren't in the middle of it. You were It was just basically, instead of being in front of a TV, you're in front of a, a headset. Right. It's a Game Boy, but it's not portable. <laughs> so um, it, well, they advertised it as portable though. Yeah, yeah, because you could pick it up and take it somewhere and it was all encompassing, <laughs> but <laughs> the same way as a boom box was portable in the eighties, right? Yeah, Which like you could anywhere. throw batteries in it. And I think the Virtual Boy could use batteries. I think that was one of yes. the aspects of it. Not that they lasted that long, and I think it used like a mountain of D batteries at a time, but <laughs> holy shit can you imagine what the batteries would be like that look how bad it was with a game boy i went through more double a <laughs> batteries with a fucking game boy than ever can you imagine what the virtual boy would do that thing weighed like 30 pounds you couldn't strap it to your head they made a point not to strap it to your head because it's like we're gonna fucking kill someone well even their advertising made the thing scary where it was walking around on two legs like a, a <laughs> what what are those the the big Martian invaders from <laughs> War of the Worlds. Yeah, the Tom Cruise War of the Worlds. It looked like one of those, just like seven feet tall, and it was horrifying because it was walking around with its wet red lenses, chasing a kid. Like, why would why did they think that was gonna sell the thing? <laughs> I don't know. My my only experience with this is probably the same experience that everybody's had. But I remember going to like a Kmart or something. And they had one on for a demo. And I was, okay, what year was this at? What, 93? 95. 95? Okay, so 95. Yep. So I'm 11 years old. That's, there's my age. I can do math, I swear. <laughs> I couldn't reach. Like, I was standing on my toes. <laughs> and I couldn't reach, like, my, my, uh, my head couldn't get to the fucking goggles. So I was pissed. Because I was holding the controller and I was trying to lean with my forearms onto the counter where the, they had it on. And I couldn't reach even on my toes. So I was trying and I was basically almost hopping, looking, trying to look into the damn thing. And I couldn't get anywhere. And I was playing the Wario game. and Because I had Wario, uh, was it? Mary Brothers two, uh, 3 or 2 on... Yeah, 3 was Wario Land or something. Right, so that's that was one of the few Game Boy games I owned, so I was like, man, Wario, I'll take it. I was super excited, and I remember, like, I almost started, like, I knew I wasn't going to get away with it, but I was almost going to get my dad to hold me up so I could play it, <laughs> because I wanted to try it so bad. And I couldn't do it, because, like, they had it set up, it was too, too high for a kid... And it was way too fucking low for an adult. <laughs> like, you couldn't sit down with it. You couldn't play it comfortably. So basically, all the like the cramped neck jokes and stuff that you could ever make, they all apply. It's just... Yeah. It's, it's brutal. And I just remember, like, I couldn't see anything. And I never even got a chance to get the headache that 
I'm sure I would have gotten from it because <laughs> I couldn't look in the damn visor. <laughs> yeah, for me, it was a buddy of mine, you know, the kid who had everything. So I'd go to his place and have a, he'd always have the latest console, always. And it was a sleepover the one time. And like I saw just he had this virtual boy on the shelf. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. You got the virtual boy. Can I play it? I, I've read about it in magazines, but never, never had the chance to play it. I've never seen a look on a kid's face so dismissive, like, oh, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, there's no hint of, like, no, you can't play with my new toy type of thing, right? <laughs> Not that he was a dick or anything. He was a decent kid. He was a friend. But but he was just like, yeah, whatever. Like, so over it. So completely, like, it's not my thing. So when I actually plugged it in and dusted it off, because there was dust in the thing, he only had a couple games. But I played, <laughs> it was tennis. I've never been more underwhelmed as a child playing <laughs> tennis on a virtual boy. And my neck hurt after five minutes. So it's like... We went back to playing whatever it was on the TV. I think we were playing Super Nintendo at the time. He was probably giving you that hard look because he's like, dude, this is too heavy for me to lift up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember it being that heavy. But I remember it being very unwieldy, though. Like, to- it would topple. It was just such a uh, such a bomb for Nintendo, man. <laughs> like, it's, it's, still their, it's still their biggest loss to this day. To Nintendo's credit, they basically single-handedly killed the VR gaming market for the next 20 years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, think of the momentum, right? VR was doing so good. And then Virtual Boy, not color. It's not no head tracking. And controller's bullshit. No haptics. <laughs> it was working. I mean, it's just not even virtuality-based games. You're right. It's like standard screen. I was going to say, I find that funny because even Atari for the Jaguar was developing a VR headset for that. Oh, I remember that. They even canceled it. Because it just wasn't going to pan out. Which is, there was one game that actually had the VR functionality built into it that was released. And later, the company that was developing the VR ended up releasing another VR headset for another purpose. Apparently, you can plug that into the Jaguar and get all the VR aspects of it except for the head tracking. Do you remember what game that was? It works with the Jaguar. Was it Missile Command 3D or something like that? Okay. Yeah, there's very little. I've only a very limited experience with the Jaguar. I have to go back and look at some of that. For the amount of like real VR headsets with head tracking that were in development and shelved, like in development with real momentum and then shelved. And then Nintendo was like, hey, I got you guys, Virtual Boy. And <laughs> boom, there went the market. <laughs> they, they pulled a 1983 Atari move. Right there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they basically did the video game crash again, but for VR, and it wasn't even VR. <laughs> that just shows how much power that company has, though, like to, to basically cripple an entire industry, an entire technology, because of one flop. That's crazy to me. Yeah, well, they only killed the gaming market for it. For the following 20 years, I want to say there was a lot of movement forward with the tech in other ways, especially military uses. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, just not in the gaming market. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that the big movement was screens. Uh, Sony released a number of glasses or headsets, but they were just strictly displays meant to play movies. So it was the idea of you would wear this headset and it would be virtually a 60-inch TV or 100-inch TV in your eyes. Uh, There's several releases of those. I remember wanting one. And then you'd have to plug in UMDs to watch your movies? <laughs> no, no UMDs. <laughs> like the movie Toys? Do you guys remember that movie? <laughs> oh, man. They'd put on that. They they had this virtual reality headset in the movie Toys where they'd put it on, and then they'd put earphones in, and they'd put nose plugs in because it would generate sense. This is still a thing that's like, in <laughs> fiction, heavily relied on. Not all that made use of in reality, but... Essentially, like they'd they'd go on a roller coaster or a white 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 river rafting or whatever, you know, and you'd see them on the couch just leaning various directions. Whoa, whoa, dude, that's how I play video games anyway. That's how I play <laughs> NES. <laughs> oh, it's wild. Nineties VR was definitely a thing, and then it just it just died, right? Like VR even today 
is on shaky ground, right? And that it's got Facebook money behind it now and Steam is involved. And it's still the immersion immersion factor is is key, right? It has to be the one-to-one head movements in game. You want, you know, the high quality screen so you're not seeing the the pixel, the screen door effect. That's a thing too. And just yeah. when it works for certain games, it's wild. My first experience with Elite Dangerous where it's like a space sim and I spent probably two hours playing that game, and if it, like, or I spent probably thirty minutes playing it, but it felt like two hours as I was trying to dock on a station. But it's just so immersive, just being able to look around the cockpit of a virtual ship and see the detail on the control panel, and just mind blowing. It's such such potential. The dream for VR games is still there, and if it we're close, right? But it just it's it's not there yet. No, I kind of wanted to mention. Going back into the tangents of VR, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever tried uh, like a flight simulator that's actually in a cockpit of a jet with a big screen around you and everything. The only simulators I did was when I was in crane operation. <laughs> and we had like a <laughs> cab of a crane that they hooked up to their simulator, which was basically a really shitty projector and... Uh, <laughs> it was something that looked like it came off of Windows 3.1 for a shareware game. So. <laughs> oh, no. Um, I want to say it was in 2013 I got to try this. It was a place out in Los Angeles called Flight Deck where you actually go and you end up being able to dogfight with other people. Oh, really? Yeah, they have like eight of these jet bodies set up, which apparently were actual parts of jets, like the cockpits that were salvaged and just used for this now. Yeah, that's what they did with the crane operation one. They yeah. had like, um, what do you call it? They had like hydraulics and everything underneath, so there would actually be movement and stuff. Yeah, so they they get you in and they've got all these little readers on the, the console in front of you, like you're actually in a jet. Yeah, well, right. in the cockpit, but the console in front of you with all the buttons and switches and everything, and a number of them actually work. And you've got the screen up ahead of you that, you, you know, you're close enough to it to where it's really all you can see. And it's curved. Those are my altimeter stuck at sea level. <laughs> <laughs> and, you you know, you're flying around and you see the gauges on the, the console in front of you changing with what you're doing. And you get like that kind of classifies as VR to me, even though it's not a headset, just because you're still immersed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That's the key thing, the immersion. I mean, if if we're going by headset, then yes, Virtual Boy is one. If if we're going by the immersion and stuff, then you know, Power Glove and stuff is one. So I mean, it it bleeds over into other things, which is kind of cool to think about. And like for the immersion, you really need the the multiple senses, right? You need the touch at some point. You want the visual. You want the the fan in your face. You have to combine various things to trick your brain and to make it feel like you're there. And if it comes down to you know getting a friend to poke you in the butt with a, a broomstick if they see you die <laughs> in the game, then, I mean, pff, fuck it, why not? That's a whole other kind of reality. <laughs> yeah. I, th- I feel like once they've got the head tracking down really well, it'll move on to trying to figure out how to actually get your hands, actually mimicking your hands properly instead of using a controller to push a button for each finger and things like that. So it's there, um, Leap Motion came out a couple of years ago with the finger tracking and it's really great how it is but because there's no there's no tactile sensation like the best example is something like Skyrim or other VR games where you wield a sword you can hold the sword with your hands you can flex your fingers you can spin it around it, it, fe- it looks really great and it feels good until you hit something when your sword flies through them because it's not physical there's no tactile force back Mm. Um, that's what that's where it becomes very difficult, and that's why I think all the best VR stuff stuff you can play today is you're either in a cockpit, um, but even even if you're not, it's all gun based. You're shooting things, yeah. Because then you can do you can shake the controller for feedback of a gun shooting, but you don't have to worry about actually trying to punch somebody with it. Yeah, which would be crazy. I'm just thinking of stuff like trying to play Devil May Cry three, and I just remember there's a few hits that would your sword would just ricochet off of enemies and it would be like, ting, ting. And I'm just like, <laughs> ah, ah. <laughs> I'd just be doing that with a controller and I'd be like, ah. And that's why the PS5 controller has potential if people will use it, is you can, for a racing game, 
you know, it, the, the controller, the trigger is pushed back as you're pulling on them as a, as a real brake would in a car. Stuff like that is feels small, but can be very impactful in your immersion with the game. So it's, it's stuff that needs to come to VR. Anybody else have any thoughts? Yeah, I, I kind of want to say that I didn't realize the the barrier for re-entry for VR when it happened in you know the mid-2010s. I had no idea it was literally just because lens cost was so high. Yeah. And figuring out how to use a cheap lens and then doing everything else on the software side was the trick. And like being able to run that stuff to displays, relatively high def considering, right? It was 720p per eye at a high enough frame rate, right? Like in a, in a time when people complain if they can't get, you know, 60 frames in a video game, you need like 90 in modern VR. Otherwise you feel queasy, right? But it's every year that goes by, it gets better and better. The Oculus Rift or the Oculus Quest 2 looks pretty solid. Just, you know, Facebook bullshit aside. But it's just, there's too few companies in well, the game. Thanks, dude. There goes our Facebook sponsorship. <laughs> Sorry, I suck. No, I'm okay with that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, VR is all about the games right now, and there, there's just there's no killer app for it, and there's just well, we should save that for another episode though. I could totally talk about Oculus and Kickstarter and all that stuff, and PSVR, PS4 VR. I think Wolf, you've had a chance to play with. Yes, uh, we have one. We also have the Switch with the uh, VR Toycon, the Labo VR Labo. Oh, the Labo. Yeah, so we should do another episode on modern VR. I, before, because I think it's going to be after new Pokemon Snap comes out, I want to mention now, I'm really hoping that new Pokemon Snap incorporates the VR Labo as an option to play. I hope so, but you can never you can never tell with Nintendo, man. They added Labo support for Mario Odyssey, I think it was. Yeah. <laughs> like, just the most random things, right? I thought Labo was just cardboard. It is. It's cardboard. It's <laughs> so the VR Labo to for Polish and anybody else who is unaware, it's a cardboard assembly, but then it does have the little lens pieces. So when you put the switch oh, okay. inside okay. the cardboard fixture and put it on your head or against your face or however you've got it built, yeah, you see what's going on in there. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. And the VR with the Labo is actually not bad. It's just not very supported. Well, that's Labo, right? There's so there's so little to do play on those things. Building it's fun. I, I like doing the ones that we've done so far. The wife built the VR one. We haven't built the other one yet. She hated it. <laughs> did she? Yeah, she was miserable. Look, I saw Jake building one. It it did not look fun. <laughs> well, it just you think it's something your kids are going to do. But my daughter was, what, six at the time. So it just end up being this is what daddy's gonna build <laughs> as she keeps asking me when she can play it <laughs> in our house it was kiddo was in control of the button to go forward or backward yeah that was it <laughs> definitely for older kids anyway we're off on tangents again yep uh where can folks find you Polsh? you can find me here and sometimes on twitch at twitch.tv slash Polsh 109 that's p-a-l-s-h 109 wolf where can people find you Twitter and Twitch slash werewolf, W-A-R-E-W-U-L-F-F. Tell Google you meant it. I'm not giving you guys that this week. No, you make fun of me for it. I love that. (laughs) You know, you're not supposed to give it every time. You can't just give up the cookies all the time. You got to tease people. You got to come back for that last line. That's why I come back. I mean, (laughs) well, and I'm sick, Jake. You can find me on Twitch. And Twitter. I'm not going to spell it, but I can at least say now I've been streaming. This is true. Whether I'm still streaming by the time this airs will be funny, but I think I'm going to be. You've streamed what? Three or four times in the last two weeks? I'm impressed. Four times in less than a month, which is like more than I streamed in a year and a half. <laughs> so come to my stream. Spend your channel points. S-I-C-J-A-K-E. Yeah. Google didn't mean that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, this has been Press Me to Cancel. We're not See you done next yet, week. But we're not done yet. For anybody who's listening, we have Patreon now. So if you want to support us, really appreciate it. If you want to check it out, just pay whatever you want, however often you want, and you get access to Werewolf. Take it away. Bonus content in the film, in uh, currently in the form. We don't know if it's going to stay this way, but this is how it is right now. 
some of our council members here watching a movie and riffing on it. So you get to play the audio along with watching the movie yourself and hear us make fun of it, talk about it, go on tangents as we tend to do, all that good stuff. Yeah. Right now you have The Thing, and I really want to do Masters of the Universe with one of you guys this weekend. So yeah, it's good stuff. Otherwise, you know, find Press B to Cancel, Instagram, Twitter, sometimes on YouTube. You know, tell your mother. Tell your friends. Please like, favorite, subscribe, pass it around. Share. This has been Press B to Cancel. Alphabet. Alphabet cereal. <laughs> There you go. It's, that robot said it like it needed an oil change. Yeah, my <laughs> voice has not been doing it that well lately. Special thanks for music. Go to Arthur the Last Ancient on Spotify or The Last Ancient on Bandcamp. For more episodes, please visit our website at pressbtocancel.com. And also, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe, and check us out on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Patreon. As always, thank you. This has been... Press B to cancel.